Murphy hitting again with nobody on the whole night. Most of the Braves have been hitting with nobody on tonight. Stopper to second. Tommy Hurry there. Wrap it up for the card. Okay, here we are. Time to look right into the world of sports and find out what's happening in baseball. So let's do that. Here's Dick Meadows. Yes, indeed. Well, we got one guy in the National League who really knows both teams. That's Atlanta and it's St. Louis. He's got those connections. Talking about Joe Torrey, he's now the manager. You know, the Atlanta Braves. He's a former Cardinal catcher and a good one. Also played infield in St. Louis. He'll be prominent tonight, and he's got an adult philosophy on children's games. the wrong uniform now, but he's still remembered in St. Louis. Joe Torre spent six years in a St. Louis Cardinals uniform. In 1971, he was the National League's batting champion and most valuable player. I had my, some of my best years here, and I think I did my growing up here, and I had my aspirations of uh, managing. It's been a rough road for Joe Torre, the manager, spending four and a half years with the miserable New York Mets. That team finishing in last place three years in a row, and last year, Torrey being fired. Taking over the Atlanta Braves this year, Torrey must have wondered whether fate was determined to deal in the wrong cards. The Braves hadn't won a playoff since 1969, hadn't had a winning season in seven years. I'm a firm believer that uh, your mind rules your body, and if the talent is there, it, uh, believing you can do something has a better chance of letting you do it than, uh, you know, thinking about if you can or if you can't. The Braves started winning, and by the 12th game of the season, Atlanta was 12-0. The celebration had already started. For Joe Torre, what a difference a year makes. I think I'm a little smarter, just like a player. More experience, I think you get better at it. The names of Torre's Atlanta players are not exactly household words. The team is about the same as it was when the Braves were in the doldrums. The players say Torre is the reason they became winners. He's always been the kind of guy that would, uh, if you needed something, he was there, you know, and you could talk to him. A friend as well as a manager. Torrey views his success philosophically. It works, you're smart. doesn't work, you're dumb. Uh, <laughs> this year, Joe Torrey has been smart. Brought to you by Lowenbrow. When you want the taste of a truly great beer, there's really only one. Tonight, let it be Lowenbrow. And by Chevrolet, who invites you to take charge of a new Chevrolet car or truck at your Chevrolet dealers now. Guys, temperature in the 70s, more than 50,000 at Bush Stadium. As we get set for the start of game two, right now, Tony Tennille at the microphone for the singing of our national anthem. By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight for the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still
ever. The preceding message was furnished by Major League Baseball. A fitting touch now at St. Louis as the ceremonial first ball will be thrown out by the children of the late Ken Boyer, the longtime Cardinal third baseman, former manager of the Cardinals, who died several weeks ago of cancer. This is Susan Hartwig, children David, Jane, and Danny Boyer. And the crowd here in St. Louis for the ovation as they are introduced. Remembering full well, one of the most popular Cardinals of all time. the first ball preparatory to game number two in the lineup tonight first for the Atlanta Braves Cordell Washington to leave things off in right field the first stop is Rafael Ramirez batting second big man in the lineup Dale Murphy hitting third and center Chris Chambliss in the cleanup spot tonight Bob Horner at third base he's been playing despite the hyperextended elbow the great utility man Jerry Royster the shrine in left field Glenn Hubbard, the glue in the infield at second. Bruce Benedict catching Necro tonight. And Phil on the mound at the age of 43. As we look at the Cardinal defense, Keith Hernandez at first base. The second baseman is Tommy Herb. The Cardinal shortstop, Ozzie Smith, over in the Gary Templeton deal during the offseason. And at third base, Ken Oberg fell. Cardinals with a good inner defense and a lot of speed in the outfield. Lonnie Smith in left. The rookie Willie McGee will be in center. He started the season with John Stuper at Louisville. And George Hendrick, who led the club and runs batted in, is in right field. Back of the plate is Darrell Porter. And on the mound for St. Louis is John Stuper. And this had to be the last place he thought he would be when he started the season. John Stuper beginning the year in triple-A ball at Louisville. And here's what Whitey Herzog had to say about him. John Stuper is a kid that, that was very impressive in my spring training camp in 1981. I sent him out at the time he had no triple-A experience, and he went to triple-A. Uh, I saw him pitch numerous times during the strike. He had a bad year. He was 5-14. and 14. He was pitching high. He couldn't get the ball down. He didn't pitch winter ball last year like he did. He rested. He came to spring training. Wasn't very impressive. I, uh, I'd have to say he was throwing the ball good, but he still couldn't get the job done because he just hung too many sliders, got too many balls up. So that's a year at AAA. Won 7 out of 8. Had an ERA of 1.45. When Andy Rincon called her, and I wanted to bring a right-handed ripper, I brought him up, and he's been a lifesaver to us. The thing he's done best is pitch against pressure in big ball games. He's beat Venezuela in L.A. He's beat uh, Atlanta on a four-hitter in Atlanta. He beat uh, the Phillies the night after Carlton shut us out to take a half-game lead. He's the guy that pitched the shutout. So he's been a lot of big ball games, and he's strived on pressure. And I tell you, he's got good pitching know-how. He's a real bright young man, and he's got a good arm. That had a figure in Whitey's decision. Pitching under pressure here at Bush Stadium. Not a home run hitter's park by any stretch of the imagination. Symmetrical, 330 down the line, 386 to the gaps, and 414 to straightaway center. Here we go finally with game number two. Waddell Washington to lead things off in the first pitch of the game. He's taken for a strike. Washington, Ramirez, and Murphy in the first inning. to get their what they want to get their offense going because they want to get back to the confines of uh, Atlanta where they love to play in that ballpark and in front of their enthusiastic fans they're going to have to get something going here Joe Torrey and Atlanta Braves want to go home with a split the umpiring alignment Bob Engel working the plate no balls two strikes on Washington who had two hits in game one a five one and two Washington the player of the month in the National League in September in the game that was rained out, he was one for three and scored the only run of the aborted contest. One and two, count holding. They're trying to jam Washington. They want to keep the ball in tight on him. And as you can see, Porter, he'll, as soon as he gives his sign, he'll give the location to Stuper, and he'll move in on the breaking ball and in the fastball.
first inning. Then we'll take a look at Rafael Ramirez. John Cooper, 25 years old. Born, lives in Butler, Pennsylvania. Started his pro career in the Pittsburgh organization in 1978. 18th round draft choice by the Pirates. And then in a minor league deal sent to St. Louis prior to the 79 season. Ramirez batting with one out. Takes a strike, going one. There's some Pennsylvania boys out there. You know, you've got Stuper and you have uh, her and you have... Uh... Suter, you've got Garber, they're all from the state of Pennsylvania. Tommy Lasorda from Norristown, of course. One and one to count. 92 miles an hour, the clocking, to give you an idea of how hard Stuper can throw. The other day, of course, we saw Andujar up in the 90s. But Drosian came out of the Atlanta pen up in the 90s, but he was ineffective the other night. One ball, two strikes to count on Ramirez. Rafael hit 278 during the regular season and provided surprising power with 10 home runs. 1-2 delivery. Did he check? No. Comes around and he gets it. So Super throwing a breaking ball well out of the strike zone and quickly two guys. Romero thought that he didn't uh, swing on this ball, but he certainly did, and uh, it was a very, very bad breaking ball. That was a right kind of pitch when you're ahead two strikes. You throw that kind of ball, you can't get hurt. And Engel, the plate umpire, was sure himself. Sometimes on a swing like that, they'll appeal. You might get the call from first base. But Engel called him out here. Two gone. Dale Murphy is the batter. Runs it in on him. 0-1 the count. What a year this young man has had. He is an outstanding ball player, both offensively and defensively. And uh, he has been a uh, contributing factor to the drive for the Atlanta club. And, and in my opinion, he has all the credentials to be the MVP of the league. He certainly did up until early September. Oh, and to the count. He tailed off at the end. Part of the problem was he did not have Bob Horner hitting behind him. He wasn't seeing perhaps the pitches he would have seen had Horner been in the lineup. Still, he wound up tied with Al Oliver for the league lead in RBIs. Checks here. One ball, two strikes to count. If you're wondering, last night, as you take a look at the graphic illustrating Murphy's durability this year, Pete Rose was one of the others, along with Steve Garvey and Johnny Ray, and Murphy looked at full strike three. So Super begins by setting down the sign in order, striking out a pair after a half. It's Atlanta nothing, and the Cardinals coming up. Cardinal lineup. Tommy Hurd to lead things off. Hurd hit 266 during the regular year. Ken Obergfell is at third base. He was very hot down the stretch. Lonnie Smith bats third, wound up hitting 307. Cleanup hitter is Keith Hernandez at 299. That was his lifetime mark. Daryl Porter hits fifth. He's back of the plate in front of George Hendrick, who has a lot of problems against knuckleballers. Willie McGee is in center field, batting seventh. Ozzie Smith at shortstop. And the man on the mound for the Cardinals, John Stuper, who set down Washington, Ramirez, and Murphy. One, two, three. The Braves defensively, the infield of champ. Chambliss, Hubbard, Ramirez, and Horner. Outfield of Royster, Murphy, and Washington. Bruce Benedict is back of the plate. Phil Necro is on the mound. If you're wondering, the last time Necro started with two days rest, 1977, early in the season, in April, he started against the Dodgers, pitched five and a third innings, came back with two days rest against Cincinnati, and pitched only two-thirds of an inning in a game in which the final score was 23-9. to the other day, going four and a third innings, he threw 65 pitches. While Decro was taking his warm-up pitches, we could see that Whitey had Bob Engel over on the side, and he was talking to him. And I know one thing, he wasn't asking him where he was going to go to eat after the game. He was talking about what you talked about in the pregame show, about what the Cardinals feel is a balk move. Whitey was out to argue that in the rained out game on Wednesday. Tommy Hur taking outside ball one. Hur over itself and Smith in the bottom of the first inning. Tommy is a switch hitter, but again, we'll point it out if you weren't with us for the earlier telecast. No lefties on the Atlanta stand. One and one. this year against right-handers by far than lefties. Two and one. Phil's going to have to face 
a, a team that is contact hitters. They hit the ball to the opposite field a great deal. They run. They very rarely strike out. And they very rarely hit into double plays. These fellas do not overswing. Doing one to count on her. Who takes outside for ball three. Now you saw Necro's record on the road this season. An unbelievable 14 and one. The one loss. One to nothing. There's Ted Turner. The owner of the Atlanta Braves. And in his box near the Atlanta dugout. Had nothing to cheer about in game one. The 3-1 pitch is outside. Nothing to cheer about this part tonight either. So her at first base and Oberfell is the batter. They'll not bludgeon you to death. They were last in the league in home runs. And, of course, when you have that type of attack, you rarely strike out. Cardinals, in fact, trailed only the Dodgers in fewest strikeouts this season for a team. Rounded down to the right side. Hubbard goes to Ramirez for one. Back to first, and not in time there. Oberfell legging it out. Ramirez... Slightly out of sequence coming across the bag at second base. They get out of the batter, batter's box very, very fast. And uh, tough to double them off, as you saw right there. Take a look here. It's a tailor-made double play ball down to Hubbard at second. To Ramirez. From that angle, Rafael looks like he gets off a decent throw from second base, but not in time. Lonnie Smith. 307 during the regular season, hits it in the right field for a base hit. Oberfell is on his way to third, and he's in there. So here we go again, a la Thursday. Never hesitated. He went from first to third without any problem whatsoever. So Nico in immediate trouble here. Smith going the other way by Chambliss out into right field. There's a situation now where you have the... Chambliss holding the runner on, and Hubbard close to second base in order to make the double play. So you create a big hole on that right side, and that's why Lonnie Smith went in that direction. Runners at first and third, one gone. Keith Hernandez is the batter. Very few of the Cardinals with good career stats against Nico. As a matter of fact, the other day there was some speculation George Hendrick might not play, contending that Necro puts him into a slump. Bruce Benedict needs a new glove. And Necro has sent many a guy back to the lunch bucket, yes. believe me. So Benedict, who's the man on the spot, he's got the oversized glove, which helps to an extent. Go to first base. He's got a very quick move to first base. Very quick. To have that good move to first base, you got to have quick feet, and that's what Phil does. And they double play depth again, and again to throw to first base. Lonnie Smith, second in the league in steals this season, trailed only Tim Raines. He wound up with 68. There's a very tough out. Uh, Keith Hernandez is a contact hitter. He hits the ball off fields, and he's an extra base power hitter. Hits a lot of balls in the alleys. Low for a ball. He is not your prototypical cleanup hitter, but that sort of indicates the team that the Cardinals have built, the team that doesn't rely on the home run. They've got a man who had only seven home runs batting cleanup, but he does the job. He drives in a lot of runs. Yep. 94 during the regular year. Shot for ball two. Two and the count. Is outside for ball three. Three and all with Daryl Porter on deck. Negro back to back shutouts, closing the regular season against the Giants and the Padres. Then four and a third shutout innings the other day, but of course that was washed away. In trouble here. 3 0 pitch gets the green light and whacks it foul down the left field line. Three and one. 
You can rest assured now that if Lonnie uh, Smith gets a jump, he's going to go. The theory, I guess, they're swinging 3-0, and Tommy, is that 3-0, and you're probably going to get a fastball. So give him the green light. That's right. And he knows that uh, Nico doesn't want to walk him, and he's going to come in with that fastball, and uh, that's a good pitch to hit. So it was a good call on the on the part of Whitey Herzog. Here's a 3-1 pitch. Hernandez grounds it foul down the right field line, and the count is full at 3-2. and two. catch it on the fly. Would have been an easy double play. Watch it again. Overfeld couldn't come in because he thought the ball was going to be caught. So he had to wait. Ramirez coming in and has to short hop the ball. Bear handing it. If he had caught the ball, it would have been a cinch double play because Smith was going from first to second on the pitch. So runners now at second and third. Two down. Porter is the batter. First base open, working on the left-hander here with the right-hand batting Hendrick next. Low for a ball. And a good thing about Necro uh, in this situation, knowing that he has an outstanding catcher like Benedict, he is not afraid to throw that knuckleball at, at any time. Normally, when you have a good knuckleball pitcher, you have to worry about the catcher catching the ball. One and one to count. second consecutive disappointing offensive season and it much better this year on the road than at home lays off here again and it misses the ball three it looked like the bottom fell out of that knuckleball it's really amazing how benedict handled that look at this pitch right here pressure now on Benedict. If you let one get behind you with nobody on base, no problem. He's the best I've seen catching the knuckleball. You let one get behind you here, and it's one to nothing. 3-1 pitch, and that one bounces away from Benedict, and rolling into the Cardinal dugout. They're allowed to advance one base, and they get a run. Lonnie Smith has to stop at third. That was on a very, tough quarter. Pitch. very tough pitch for Benedict to handle. again, Necro bouncing one with a man at third. And it was all Porter could do to get out of the way. Darrell made a good move. He's, if he's hit by the pitch, then no run scores. And Benedict can't handle it. Right. I don't know how he got out of the way of that pitch. It rolls into the dugout. One base advance. So Overfell scores. Smith is now at third. Scored as a wild pitch. There's Lonnie. Runner at first is Porter drawing the walk. One to nothing, Cardinals. Here's Hendrick. Inside, ball one. One and oh. Necro, not prone to wild pitches. He made only four during the regular season. However, lifetime, 194. How about Tommy John today up in Milwaukee? Who would figure that? That is three. very, very unusual. Tommy John throwing three wild pitches. One and one. Brewers tying that series. Fifth game, the County Stadium tomorrow. The winner to the series. The one-one pitch. That is trouble. Shot. That is Tough trouble. Tough play for Ramirez, who throws on the run and just does get him to save a run. So in the inning, the Cardinals settle for one run, one hit, and leave two. At the end of one full, the Cardinals won. And the Braves nothing. John Stuper, who looked very sharp in the first, here's what John said earlier about pitching under a lot of pressure. He is son. Well, very much. Um, I I uh, worry when I'm not nervous. Uh, I pitched in front in with, against Fernando Valenzuela in Dodger Stadium, and I was very nervous and came up with a pretty good game. Um, a few times this year, I felt comfortable in the big leagues. I, I just felt real comfortable here and had bad performances. So I'm looking forward to being a little nervous. news for the Braves as <laughs> he was nervous in the first and gets better in the second as Chambliss leads off the pitch outside ball one if you look back on last inning you'll see how the uh, Cardinals scored that one run 
Oberfeld would look like a perfect double play ball, hustled down the first base and eliminated the double play, which gave Lonnie Smith the opportunity to hit the ball in the hole, which would not have been there with the double play, and consequently they scored a run. The 2-0 pitch is low, and the other key thing, too, Darrell Porter with his agility able to get out of the way of the pitch at his feet. Going as a wild pitch and ending St. Louis the lead. In for a strike to Chambliss, Chris taking all the way, and the count three and one. have been silent. They scored just one run, coming to bat five times in the rainout on Wednesday. Chambliss whacking it, and it's loved by her at second. Tommy Hur moving to his left, reaching up for the ice cream cone catch. Again, goes to show what a fine defensive club they are. Chambliss on what looked to be a solid base hit into right field, and judging his leap perfectly. Her Falling it in for the out. One gun. Bob Horner at the plate. In the air to center field. Willie McGee is right there. Two guys. So the Braves leaving their bats, I guess, out on the coast. Remember, they came in here in the rain out on Wednesday. They scored one run in five at-bats. Shut out by force the other night. Stuper has set down the first five here tonight. And with two down in the second inning, Jerry Royster is the batter. Royster, a most valuable brave during the stretch drive over the past couple of months. Hits it in the air, foul down the left field line. And out of play. Royster, the way they defense him, they uh, they want him to hit the ball to the other side of the field. They pitch him that way because that's where they play him, and he's trying to get that bat out a little bit quicker so he can pull the ball. Those numbers will tell you if you don't get the stupor fairly early, you might be in some trouble. The Braves, who led the league in scoring and in home runs during the regular season, trying to get something started. Trailing one nothing in the second inning. Two out, bases empty as it's grounded back toward the middle. Ozzie Smith can't glove it, and in the center field for a base hit. So Royster is a boy. The field is in pretty decent shape. We've had a lot of rain, obviously, over the past 96 hours here as you watch Jerry single up the middle. The infield, of course, has been covered. It's slightly slick, however, because of all the moisture. And you can tell in the outfield, of course. The contrast in colors there. Stuper created the cardinal sin of pitching when he allowed a, a base hit with two strikes and no balls on the hitter. That's the time he's going to have to go to a certain area. Hubbard at the plate, grounding it down to Hernandez. Right at the bag. And that's that for Atlanta. No runs, one hit. Leave one in the middle of the second inning. It's the Cardinals one and the Braves nothing. Here's a man with a very tough mission, obviously, tonight. Bruce Benedict. Here's what his battery mate thinks about him. Now, Phil, don't you unwittingly put enormous pressure on Benedict against a running club by the mere use of the knuckler? Well, I don't think I put him on it. I think that the pressure is always already maybe there because there are so many knuckleballs coming at him. I know he doesn't put any pressure on himself. We've talked about this before, and I don't think it's going to matter to him whether it's the playoff game or, or the middle of the game throughout the regular season. Uh, I think he's probably the finest knuckleball catcher I've ever seen, and it's a challenge to him. He accepts it. He likes to catch knuckleballs. He'll call men on third base with men on second base. So he really doesn't matter because you know, I think he realized that if we're going to win, we're going to win with the knuckleball regardless of what the situation is. Negro working on McGee here in the bottom of the second inning. Want to know the count. That was a question that Howard, of course, asked the other day. The coach not with us tonight. He's in Pittsburgh. He'll be back with us in Atlanta tomorrow. You have to realize that this is a very, very tough pitch. First to develop and then to master. There are only three... Knuckleball pitchers in baseball. You have the Negro brothers, Joe with the Houston Astros, and of course Charlie Huff with the Texas Rangers. It is a type of pitch that comes out of the fingers without any spin to it. It's thrown off the fingertips, and the pitcher doesn't know where it's going, nor does the catcher know where it's going. It's liable to break this way one time, break another way the next time. So if you can't catch it, you must realize it must be tough to hit. Next pitch to McGee. 
just missing. Looked like Bob Engel ready to come up with the right arm. The other thing about the knuckleball is it puts less pressure on your arm, which is the reason why a Necro can still be going at 43 and why Hoyt Wilhelm was still going in his late 40s. McGee fouls it back. Well, you know, uh, I think Bob Euchre gave the uh, best description on how to catch a knuckleball <laughs> is when it gets by, uh, wait until it stops rolling and then go back and get, get it. Get it, yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow, California, Milwaukee, game five to determine it all. You'll see that four o'clock Eastern, three central, one o'clock out on the coast. And we'll be in Atlanta tomorrow night for game three at eight Eastern time. Ozzie Smith at the plate with one out of the base is empty. A strike. Starting to say, if you come back with two days rest, it's easier if you're a knuckleball pitcher. Remember, years ago, Chuck Tanner, for a good part of the season when he was with the White Sox, had Wilbur Wood pitching every third day. That's right. Specialty, the knuckler. One of the great uh, knuckleball pitchers, Hoyt Wilhelm, could pitch every day when he was a relief pitcher with it. One, two pitches outside. If there's been a winner in this series so far, it's the people that own the hotels and run the restaurants and bars. A bonanza for them. <laughs> two extra days and a lot of time on people's hands Wednesday and last night. Ball three, three and two. So it's been a bonus for the merchants. Some of the players have been a little anxious. Especially last night, a lot of guys wanted to get it on, but there was no way. Ball four. So Nico has walked his third Number man. 48, in an inning and a third. And John Stuper comes to the plate. Necro this season averaged less than three walks per nine innings, so that tells you right off the bat with three in an inning and a third that he's really not on the mark tonight yet. Smith at first base, Horner in shallow at third as Chambliss holds the runner on at first, and Necro throwing over there. And as you can see that time, as Phil came set, Super had already made the motion to square around. Think, as you can see there, to seal against this battery. They send the runner on the front run, and it's butted down to Chambliss, and Chris makes the play. But Super is able to make contact, and down to second goes Smith. On the artificial surface, with everybody knowing you're bunting, Herzog sending the runner, and they have him at second now with two down. Number That's 20. what I said the other day. When you have those infielders charging in, and you have the turf where the ball rolls quick, in order to defeat that, you have to run the runner. So now Tommy Herr, who started the first inning with a walk, is the batter. Herr was two for five in game one. Cardinals one, Braves nothing. Two out, bottom of the second. Ozzie Smith at second. Rounded down to Ramirez. And Raphael over to Chambliss to retire the side. So nothing doing for the Cardinals. We played two full at Bush Stadium. St. Louis one, Atlanta nothing. Game two at Bush Stadium in St. Louis. The Cardinals won. The Braves nothing. Eight, nine, and one hitters for Atlanta. Bruce Benedict, Phil Necro, and Claudel Washington facing John Super. Benedict was one for three in game one off Bob Porsche. The rookie, John Super, ready to work in the third. Missing away, ball one. Super called up early June. He was 7-1 with a league-leading 1.46 ERA at Louisville. 2-0 the count. College scores for you. West Virginia a winner by 7 over Boston College today. Alabama by three touchdowns over Penn State. Virginia Tech eking one out over Duke. And Georgia easily over Mississippi. 3-0 the count. North Carolina rolling by 17. People seem to think that when a batter is hitting eighth in the lineup that he's a very bad batter. It's a very, very important spot in the lineup because 
you have to get on base in order for the pitcher to bunch on. If you come up the bat with two men on, you got to get on. That way the pitcher will hit that inning rather than leading off the next inning with an out. And if you get on with less than two outs, the pitcher will be able to bunch over. So it's very important at that eighth spot. Nico does his job by laying one down to Hernandez, who thinks about second, and then goes to first, where her covers and Benedict advances. So there's the tying run. Benedict now at second base on the three-four sacrifice. And Claudel Washington coming up. The eighth spot, as Tommy mentioned, important here. Missouri and Kansas State. Other scores tied. 7-7. Michigan a winner. Big day for Anthony Carter. Northwestern. Shocking Minnesota. They've got a powerhouse up there with Denny Green. And Notre Dame beats Miami by two with Wisconsin beating Ohio State 6 to nothing. Nebraska easily over Colorado. Arkansas by 18 over Texas Tech. Waddell Washington fly to center in the first inning. He's two for five thus far in the playoffs. And drills it foul into the right field corner. 0-1. Talking about the eighth spot in the National League, how important it is. Oklahoma over Texas by six. Auburn beating Kentucky 18-3. UCLA and Arizona. Shocker there for the Wildcats. Washington rolling, number one, beating Joe Capps Club. And Air Force beats Navy by three. Oh, one pitch is chopped foul. That nine spot in the American League, Tommy, has become a big spot. People have changed their thinking about that over the years. And all of a sudden, you're seeing a lot of your pretty decent hitters batting at the bottom of the lineup in the other circuit. That's right, because it's very important down on that park because you have your good hitters in the third and fourth and fifth spot, and you'd like to get some runs from the bottom half. They're trying to keep the ball in on this fellow. They want to jam him real bad. Now, Porter calls time. You know, when uh, you get some catchers who get into the position and they try to give location, what happens... Those coaches at first and third sometimes will call the pitch for the batter. They'll say, hey, they're going to throw a fastball inside, and consequently, they know. You saw Porter going to the mound. They brought Ozzie Smith in, perhaps something to do with the signs. Of course, you change your signs with a runner at second. There's a possibility that Benedict may be relaying the signs to Claudel Washington. And so Porter brought Smith in as it's fouled away. Of course, Ozzie wants to know what the signs are, too, so he can perhaps position himself at shortstop. When you have a catcher on base like Benedict, who has given a lot of signs, he will pick those signs up quicker than other guys. And he may have the signs, and he's given him a message on what the pitch is. And a lot of ways they do it, when they take their lead off second base, sometimes they bend over, it's a breaking ball. One-two pitch is up high, and that's exactly why I'm sure Porter went out, brought Ozzie in, and said, okay, let's just change the sequence right, a little right. bit here. And if they stand straight up, it's the fastball. Some of them will use the crossover step when they're taking their lead, which would indicate a curveball, and otherwise they would just kind of dance off, which would mean it would be a fastball. So you watch Benedict, and they're watching him also. Now he's bent over with his hands on his knees. That was a breaking ball. And he ran it in on him and down on him for strike three. Super got him to go after his pick way inside. Two down. There are some hitters, of course, who say, hey, look, I know if you're at second, you can steal signs. I don't want to know anyway. And a lot of them want him. Ramirez at the plate. The pitch to Raphael. Taking low, ball one. They send a message to him immediately. He's going to throw him a lot of breaking balls. This is the pitch that Ramirez has problem with. He's a good fastball hitter, and he likes the fastball down. something to cheer about and it would have
been close at home because Benedict is not the swiftest runner and had McGee fielded this one cleanly, it would have been interesting. But as you can see, it skips by him. It skids. I don't know if it hits a wet spot or what out there. You can see the contrast in the color with all the rain here. The ball staying down on Willie, and by the time Hendrick can get it back in, it's too late. Ramirez circles the bases. It's a single and an error charge to McGee, and Atlanta leads it 2-1. to one. It takes a break like that to get a team gone, and uh, right now that's a big help to the Atlanta Braves. Dale Murphy at the plate. The count is 0-1. That's exactly what the Braves needed at this point. A break like that, and a big one. Rafael Ramirez. A single, and then three bases on the air, and it's 2-1 Atlanta. Foul away. No balls, two strikes. One-two pitch side foul ground playable for Hernandez and Keith traveling the line now still in foul ground makes the catch they get two runs through the Braves one hit one error no one left it's Atlanta two St. Louis one after two and a half Al Michaels and Tommy Lasorda in St. Louis as we go to the bottom of the third inning Ken Oberfeld to lead things off Oberfeld Lonnie Smith and Hernandez a reminder too close for comfort coming up a new episode along with It Takes Two, a new show premiere next Thursday on ABC at 9 Eastern, 8 Central Time. Oberkfeld takes a strike and the count is 0-1. Oberkfeld was the man who led to the Cardinal run in the bottom of the first inning by legging it safely down to first on what looked like a double play ball. The center to Murphy, one gun. Number 27, left fielder Lonnie Smith. Lonnie Smith, who then moved Oberkfell over to third with his single to the hole in the first inning as the batter. One for one tonight, two for four in the two games. Two to one Atlanta, bottom of the third inning. Popped up, shallow right, Hubbard out and Washington in, and it's Claudel calling Hubbard off. The right fielder's ball, and Glenn, after looking like there might be a collision initially, giving way, as he's supposed to do. Number 37, first baseman, Keith Hernandez. So two down very quickly, and Keith Hernandez is the batter. Again, another look. And it's Washington's ball here. Hubbard going out. Bordell coming in. And Cordell says, I'll take it. Glenn hears him. Negro got two outs on two pitches. Hernandez taken outside, ball one. A strike. Two outs on two pitches normally tells you that no matter who the batter is, you're going to take that next pitch, which Hernandez did. You don't want to see a pitcher get away with just three. The count one and two something you rarely see. You almost never see an inning over and three. Occasionally it happens once or twice a season. Once in a while, but very, very rarely because that, that third hitter will definitely take one pitch. And if it's a ball, he'll take another one. One-two delivery. is swung on and missed. Benedict has it rolled away, but he's able to scoop it up. Down to Chambliss. So it takes Necro six pitches to get rid of the Cardinals in the third. We'll go to the fourth. It's Atlanta two and St. Louis one. Bob Horner on deck as we start the fourth inning. Here's what his skipper, Joe Torrey, thinks about his third baseman. Bob Horner, to me, is probably the most disciplined hitter I've ever seen for the limited experience Bobby has. He's got a short stroke. Uh, he knows what the strike zone is. He's not afraid to take the walk. And he just makes the rest of the hitters to hit in front of him much better because of the fact that uh, managers like Whitey Herzog don't want to face Bob Horner with men on base. Appropriate comment, and as much as he's on deck, and the man who they'll try to keep off base is Chris Chambliss. Chambliss hit a liner, which was speared by a leaping Tommy Hur in the second inning. One and one to count. Chris has been in these uh, playoff competition and World Series. He has the experience, and he's quite a competitor. Two and one. His wife Audrey here with him. 
of the Braves' wives are here. It's been a long time on the road. The Braves are a bunch of vagabonds, haven't been home in two weeks. It's sharply down to her, and Tommy throws them out. The Chambliss has made decent contact both times, but both times in the direction of that fellow. One guy on a horner is the batter. As a matter of fact, the Braves have been home only three days out of the last 24. They were on the road for a week. Then they went home for a three-game series against San Diego. Then they went out to the West Coast for a week, where they won the divisional title by taking five out of seven. Hit in the air to left center field, and deep, Willie McGee going back, and that's Bush Stadium for you, makes the catch. The home run in the friendly confines of Atlanta. Yep. And in uh, several other parks Number one, in the National the League, but not seven. here. So two down, and Jerry Royster is the batter, singled in the second inning. One-two pitch to Royster. Hit in the air to right center field. McGee can fly and makes it look easy. Three up and three down in the fourth inning. Cards come up, bottom of the fourth, still two to one, Atlanta. what we'll have tomorrow, California-Milwaukee, the winner of the World Series. Game five from County Stadium for Eastern. We go to Atlanta, finally. Game three tomorrow night, 8 o'clock Eastern time. The big day. Join us here on ABC. Al Michaels, Tom Lasorda with you from St. Louis. Howard Cosell in Pittsburgh tonight. He'll be back with us tomorrow in Atlanta as we start the bottom of the fourth. And Daryl Porter leading off 0-1. Outstanding knuckleball right there. Oh. Porter, Hendrick, and McGee coming up. Two to one, Braves. Outside, one and one. That game tomorrow, by the way, at Milwaukee, probable starting pitchers, Pete Bukovic against Bruce Keeson. One game for the pennants. One one pitch is outside. Got to hand it to our guys up there, Keith Jackson, Jim Palmer, Earl Weaver. They were on day and night it seemed about six hours today yeah they were out there a lot of a lot of time rain delays start delayed by rain game delayed a couple of times by rain two one pitch low ball three weaver's going to try to work out a contract to get paid by the word next year <laughs> bruce, <For> the hour. <laughs> bruce Suter, who has been inactive the other night bob force going all the way he needed no help if necessary. 3-1 pitch. Hit foul outside first. And Hal Lanier. Father Max, the major league player, and Hal several years in the bigs himself. There is Andujar in the Cardinal dugout. He's got an iron ball that he uh, uses to strengthen his arm. Porter hitting it in the air to deep right center field. Murphy going all the way back, and that one is off the fence. He plays it perfectly, but Porter is in a second with a stand-up double. <laughs> Darrell Porter, and that's a home run in a lot of parts, but here it's two bases. He had a good pitch, I'll say that. That ball had some life to it. And he went, he stayed right with it. The ball broke away from him, and he, and he got the fat part of the bat on it. There's a situation now where you have a runner on second base and nobody out. Hendricks is going to make every effort to get that runner to third base. He'll try to hit the ball to the right side and bring him over. Looks like, uh, also, Nico may have shaken Benedict off prior to that pitch. Hendrick grounded out in the first inning. It away. We also had a case there here in St. Louis. It's similar to Milwaukee, and of course, uh, you're well aware of what happened yesterday with a fan reaching out and gloving the drive that Ben Ogilvy might have caught, ruled a home run. Same situation there on that ball. Somebody leaning right out. That ball was a little short of going out, and uh, the fan could easily touch it. Foul back. Give Larry Barnett a lot of credit today, too. If you saw the interview with him prior to the California-Milwaukee game, he admitted. He said, look, I, I blew it. Bad call. Well, that's, that just goes to show you they're not perfect. They admit it when they make a mistake, just like anybody else. We all make mistakes in the game. One-two pitch. It's high and gets away from Benedict. And so the runner goes to third, and Hendrick is still at the plate. That number Bad ball exploded. Not much chance for Benedict here. 
And Bruce, the man under the gun, you can see that, hitting off the bottom of the glove. Not even got part of the bare hand. And off to the left. So the runner at third. The Braves are up at first and third now. Back at short and second. They're conceding to run. If he hits a ground ball to short or second base. But at the corners, they won't. And he strikes him out. A big strikeout. Very big. Number three for Negro. Watch the movement of this pitch right here. You talk about a moving knuckleball. Look at it. It was there when he swung. It was no longer there. You've heard the expression, guess hitter? <laughs> you know what pitch is coming, but you guess it anyway. See how the infield is really shortening up, and they're still going to concede the run. Here's McGee, especially with McGee speed. Swing and a miss. Oh, and one. There's the alignment there. That's what you might call astroturf in. Ball. If it gets down to you sharply enough at short and second, you've still got a chance. Right, and with Porter at third base, they can afford to get back a step or two rather than with someone like uh, Smith. Look at that pitch. One and one. It's been a long night for Benedict already. That brought Benedict to his knees. <laughs> one one pitch. And for a strike, and the count is one and two. Tag on McGee. No, he doesn't, says the plate umpire, Engel, but they get the out at first. There's no advance anyway by Porter. So that strikeout number four, second time Woody's gone down. And Ozzie Smith will be the batter. Benedict that pitch. staying right with it. He couldn't have hit that with a net. So with Porter at third, he has struck out Hendrick and McGee back-to-back, -back, and Ozzie Smith, the batter. Two very big strikeouts, obviously, and especially so now. You've got Smith at the plate. You've got the pitcher on deck. It's the outside corner for a strike, and the count is 0-1. And the crowd, they may not have the best angle in the world, but even from back of first and back of third, they're booing that ball. Pitcher looked away. beating out what looked like a double play initially, and then the run eventually scoring on the wild pitch. Third inning, Benedict the walk, Negro advancing him, and then Ramirez a single to center. McGee might have had a play at the plate and then overran the ball. Skipped by him, went all the way to the fence, and Ramirez circled the bases. Two to one to score. They send Smith as Stuper hits a comebacker, and Negro works out of it. So Phil, watching a man at third, nobody out, and they strand him there, do the cards, and through four, it's Atlanta two, St. Louis one. Fifth inning. Glenn Hubbard to lead things off. Hubbard, Benedict, and then Necro. And a great job done by Phil in the Leading bottom off of the, the fourth inning. Runner on third base and nobody out. Henry Hitton wind up getting two big strikeouts. Interesting. When it started out, Tommy, it looked like, well, Nico wasn't ready to go on two days rest, and then all of a sudden he seems to be getting it back together. Well, he's got his rhythm going real good now, and uh, he's got very, very good control of the knuckleball. When he can do that to you, you are in some kind of trouble. Glenn Hubbard, 0 for 1 tonight, and 0 for 4 in the two games thus far. Takes the strike. Oh, no. Stuper went all the way twice this season in 21 starts. Super relatively inactive coming in tonight. Pitched last Sunday, two innings in relief at Chicago. 
do it. So remember the Cardinals in a much different situation than the Braves. St. Louis clinched a week ago Monday, so Herzog could just get the work that he wanted each pitcher to get down the stretch. He didn't have to worry about pressure games or anything. As Hubbard lines it into right field for a base hit. So Glenn is on, and up comes Benedict, whereas Torrey, of course, was trying to win a divisional title. It was a different story for Whitey, so he was able to spot his pitchers going down that last week. But uh, with the rain out, it can't have helped him. Well, the one thing is, you, you say to yourself, is it better for a team to cinch it earlier? Is it better for a team to keep the momentum going at the last couple of days of the season? No one seems to know the real answer to that. Now, you got to remember one thing. Necro is a pretty good hitter, so in all cases, this guy might be bunting in this situation. But if you didn't have a good hitting pitcher behind him, then there would be, wouldn't be any doubt as to why he would let the guy hit. All right, quick call by you. Your manager, what do you do here? I have him hitting. Up and in, and they almost hit him. 1-0. Oh. <laughs> Bruce Benedict, as if the night has not been tough enough, now this. And Bruce says, time out while I collect my thoughts. Another look. Wow. Eerie sight right look there. Look out. You think there's no way he gets out of it. And I don't have to remind you, Tommy, of an incident last year. Say getting hit by the goose. World Series, game five. There's a, there's a situation where Joe Torre might hit and run. He has a good contact man at the plate. There he goes. There he goes, and it's hit into the right field corner, and it is a fair ball bouncing into the corner and then over the fence for a ground rule double. So that cost the Braves a probable run as Hubbard would have scored. However, still nobody out. Hubbard would have scored as he was moving with the pitch, but the ball bounding into the area down into the right field corner skipping high off the AstroTurf, so a ground rule double stops Hubbard at third. Number 35, pitcher Phil Nico. At second. Watch the way that ball kicks off of there and bounces. Ball landing fair, no question about that call. And then the high kangaroo hop off the AstroTurf here. It's amazing that that ball didn't bounce straight, rather yeah. than bounce to the right yeah. and very high over that fence. Curling toward the line as it came down. That's right. And spinning in. Here's Negro now, and Phil hits it in the air to left field, deep enough to score a run as Lonnie and Smith the guy may tag up, up from second. Make the catch, but they just send Hubbard in from third as Benedict remains at second. So Negro delivering a sacrifice fly. It's 3-1 Atlanta. Number 15, right fielder, Cardell Washington. Bill Necro, who hit a home run last week, last Friday at San Diego, his first since 1976. Both of the Necro brothers are good hitters. Yep. Pitchers. See, there was an indication of what Joe Torre of Necro's hitting ability when he hit and run with uh, Hubbard at first base and Benedict, the eighth hitter, at the plate. One out, Benedict at second. And Washington hits it high in the air to right field, tagging at second base is Benedict. Hendrick makes the catch, and Bruce is on his way to third, and he's in there easily. So two long fly balls. One to score a run, the other to move the runner over. And Ramirez is the batter. In the bullpen, the left-hander is Jim Cott, who's older than even Negro. And the right-hander is Jeff Lotte, a rookie. Cott will be 44 in November. Imagine 44 years old and still pitching in the major leagues. Yep. And Negro 43 and starting in the major leagues. Still will be 44 next April. Ramirez takes low, ball one. One and all. Oh. One all oh pitch, grounded, down is Ozzie Smith, who throws him out, and the inning is over. But the Braves stretch their advantage, a run, two hits, leave one through four and a half. Braves three, Cardinals one. For late tuners in, here's the key play of the game. Occurred back in the third inning, two out. The batter, Rafael Ramirez, Bruce Benedict, was at second base. 
A single to center. Willie McGee charging, ready to come up, throwing, and perhaps having a play on Benedict at the plate. And the ball skipped by him. Went all the way to the wall. Benedict scoring. And Ramirez circling the bases. Scored as a single, three-base error that erased a 1-0 early Cardinal lead. Made it 2-1 Braves. Atlanta getting another run in the top of the fifth inning. And leading 3-1 as we start the bottom of the fifth inning. Top of the order, Her, Obertfell, and Lonnie Smith. Her, 0 for 1 tonight, 2 for 6 in the playoffs. Tonight is 53,408. Exactly 400 more than filed in here on Thursday. Down to Hubbard. One second baseman throws out the other. One gun. Ken Obertfeld. Coming up. Number 10, the third baseman. Bush Stadium in St. Louis. When this park opened, I don't know if you might remember back, it was interesting. They had the AstroTurf surface, but they had a regular dirt infield. It was the only park like that. That's right. And they filled in the dirt a couple of years back to make it your standard artificial surface. One and the count. John Stuper, who is on the short end at the moment. And obvious in that profile. Cooper's thinking back to that third inning. Line to right field, but right in Washington. Boy, he hit a good knuckleball. That ball really broke down. Two guys. Number 27. Lowest DRA against the Cardinals at Joe Price. You don't want to see that name, Tommy. I know what he means to you. Not hardly. Fred Brining of the Giants. Great slot. Bobby Welch success against the cards and then there was Negro 1.29 during the regular season one and oh the count Negro was one and oh this season against St. Louis and in 21 innings allowed just three earned runs one and one the count Negro loves to pitch in that gray uniform some new contact lenses now. So, of course, gray, euphemistically, about the old term, right? The, the, well, you the, road. the road gray. Right. Funny, you rarely see anybody wear gray anymore. That's right. You would call them the whites and the grays. Two and two. Grounded down to short. Charged by Ramirez. And he throws him out. One, two, three inning through five. Still 3-1 Atlanta back in St. Louis after this word from our local station. Dale Murphy to lead off, still looking for his first hit in the playoffs. And here's the evaluation of Joe Torrey on Murph. Describe that. Well, Ralphie, uh, between Ralphie and, and Hubbard, uh, our second baseman, they have uh, 19 home runs and 110 RBIs or so, which is something more than I come to expect when I took this job. Ramirez has made a lot of errors for us this year, but he's made a lot of great plays, uh, especially in L.A. last week on the, in the Wednesday game when, when he had to make uh, about three or four plays in the hole in an extra inning ball game. He's got all the tools to be a great shortstop, Howard. It's just a matter of him putting it together and maturing and getting more experience to have more confidence in himself. Uh, and offensively, I, I believe the reason he's gone uh, from hitting a couple of home runs to hitting 10 for us this year is we moved him up to hitting second in the lineup uh, in front of the big monsters. That was obviously the wrong cut that we had queued up right there. Torrey talking about his double play combination. So file that away in your memory bank the next time Ramirez comes up. Meanwhile, Murphy at the plate in the count, two balls and one strike. Murphy, Chambliss, and Horner in the sixth inning. Half swing, one hopper down to Hernandez, right at the bat. One out of the sixth inning. Game two, Atlanta on top, three to one. Chris Chambliss, the batter. Tonight at halftime, Clemson having no trouble at all. A&M at the half, three points over the Cougars. George Tech. Over to Lane in the second. Vanderbilt leading Florida at the half. Tennessee, LSU knotted up. And SMU, third quarter, trailing Baylor. 13-0. Chambliss takes the strike. 0-1. Oh, 
one to count. Funny how everything can turn around simply with an Atlanta victory if they can hold on tonight. Oh, one pitch is grounded foul. The ebullient mood, the Cardinals winning the other night and winning handily with force working and the crowd celebrating in the town going wild and then all of a sudden if Atlanta pulls out a victory you're tied 1-1 just like that and not only that the rest of the series is played in Atlanta and that's where they want to be one and two and the big thing about being ahead at this particular time is that they can't think about using Suter one two to Chambliss so much has been made of Suter, Bruce Great, of course, 36 saves. You tend to forget on the other side, you've got a fellow by the name of Gene Garber, who came out of that bullpen to save 30 games for Atlanta. Fantastic this season. year. Fantastic. He and Bedrosian have had super years for that yep. ball club. It's made a difference because they've had very few complete games. So Joe Torre is really dependent on those two fellas. One hopper Look at that guy. Look at that guy. The acrobat throws. Look at that play. Gary Templeton in a hurry here. Smith coming over from San Diego. Ozzy making plays like this all year long. Down he goes, up he comes. No problem. Last time I saw a shortstop field like that, I played with a guy who later played with the Yankees by the name of Willie Miranda. He was outstanding, but he was very weak with the bat. He couldn't hit water if he fell out of a boat. But he was outstanding with the glove. Horner grounds a foul. Out. Hitless tonight. Bob in the series is 0-5. You can see what a difference the launching pad makes to Bob. More than twice as many career home runs. One and one. Alan Roth pointing out something very interesting over his career. And also, this season, he homered at home every, let's say, ten and a half at-bats. And on the road, about every 34 to the county. He hit 25 this season in Atlanta, and he hit seven on the road. Every ten and a half at bats is a better percentage than Babe Ruth had. Yeah. Alan Roth saying you are correct, sir. One-two delivery. Swung on and missed. Three up and three down. At the end of five and a half, Braves three, cards one. Tomorrow will be in Atlanta for game number three, 8 Eastern time. Rick Camp to the mound for the Braves, who came out of the bullpen to join their rotation early this season. Joaquin Andujar, the pitcher of the month of the National League in September, will work for the Cardinals as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. Al Michaels, Tommy Lasorda with you. Howard Cosell in Pittsburgh tonight for the Steel of Dinner. Back with us tomorrow. 1-0 to on Hernandez. In the Atlanta bullpen, Tommy Boggs, who would have been the starter had we played last night. Throwing. Now he's out of the rotation, at least for the moment. Hernandez hits it sharply in the right field for a base hit. So Keith, who was one for four in game one, leads things in the bottom of the sixth inning with a solid single in the right field. I wonder how the dinner's gone with Howard. We're missing. Well, before the night's over, you want to do a Cosell imitation for me? <laughs> Simple, Tommy. Really, the precipitation, which has seemingly become mandatory, has evaded tonight. I don't want you to get on, Howard. You know, he's great. You know, he's one of the most generous guys that I've ever met. In fact, Emmy told me that every year, Howard wants to donate $25,000 to the family of the unknown soldier. <laughs> He's going to have you in his neck brace tomorrow. <laughs> Daryl Porter is the batter. Porter has blocked and doubled. Brad coming to life now as the Braves lead it 3-1. to Bottom of the sixth inning.
Hernandez get a run. Hernandez scoring from first, and then Porter printed with a double and thrown out of third and getting the ovation as he comes off. Big play here to get him to keep the tying run from being 90 feet away. As the relay comes in to Bob Horner, and he's right there. Porter head first with no chance. Now you got Bedrosian warming up, and he is warming up in case uh, anything happens to Nico. Hendrick. On one. Another angle now to play at third base, and no doubt about this ball. Chopper going to be a tough play for Ramirez. Charges, steals, no play. It was a big play at third base a moment ago. He would have scored on that ground ball because it was hit so high. So the relay uh, by Hubbard to Horner was perfectly executed. Now Bob Gibson going to the mound. He's just going out to give... Uh, Phil, a little chance to relax a moment, and he's also going to give Bedrosian enough time to warm up. There's Bedrosian, who was not effective in game one, coming on in relief. Threw very hard that night, and he was the victim of the Cardinals attack. and the count is 0-1. Hendricks doesn't uh, steal too many bases. In fact, he's not even taking too much of a lead off of first base. McGee fouling it away, and quickly, Nico ahead, no balls, two strikes. Short lead by Hendricks, and McGee takes away. One ball, two strikes to count. the man the other night who hit one into the right field corner and then stopped the third when he didn't look at his third base coach Chuck Hiller on a play on which he could have had not only an inside the park homer but could have gone back to first and down he goes again so McGee having no success at all with Nico's knuckler has struck out three consecutive times and it will bring up Ozzie Smith Nico with a total now of five strikeouts Whitey's two pinch hitters from the left side with Steve Braun or uh, Dane Ork. And uh, if Ozzie gets on, in all probability, he may use one of the two. He has Bear throwing in the bullpen as they remove some litter from the field. Ozzie Smith at the plate. 3 2 Atlanta. Two out. Hendrick at first base. Bottom of the sixth inning. Horner has to stay in real close with Ozzie Smith attempt to punt. You give him a chance, he'll punt. Rounds it by Chambliss in the right field for a base hit. Hendrick will go to third as Washington's throw comes into Hubbard. That's four hits in the inning. And they'll go to the bench with Super due up here. Chambliss diving. And had to hold a runner on. Opened up the gap on that side. Base hit. And out of the Cardinal dugout comes Steve Braun, who was the opening night third baseman this year for the Cardinals. He was there because Obert fell, started the season injured. So Braun, a versatile fellow who can fill in occasionally. 
Infield or outfield. And the Cardinals' big man off the bench this year. He's a tough hitter. Coming up. He makes contact. He doesn't overswing. He doesn't try to hit the ball out of the ballpark. As a pinch hitter this season, he was 12 for 41. That comes out to 293. Smith has been running a great deal every time he got on first base, so we'll find out. He's the win and run. He's the go-ahead run, so we'll find out if he runs like he did the two previous times he was on. 0-1 oh, the count. But it's a tough job coming off that bench, hitting particularly off against uh, off of a pitcher like Necro. Very difficult to pinch hit. Hendrick at third, Smith at first. Two down, four hits in the inning for the Cardinals. There goes Smith. Uh, is he running? And the pitcher swung on and missed, and there's no throw. All Benedict has to think about here is making sure that ball doesn't get behind him. So in a situation like that with an upper ball coming in, you're almost conceding in second base. Down into the right side. Chambliss to Necro covering, and Phil escapes. So in the inning, they settle for a run, four hits, and lead two after six full, 3-2, Atlanta. The sixth inning, it's interesting. If Ozzie Smith doesn't steal second base, and then Chambliss has to hold him on. Ball not hit that sharply, but Chris obviously would have had a lot further to go. To come up with a base hit. It's interesting. They send them down a second, but that's what you cost yourself sometimes. Up to second, guess yourself about a move like that, however. Well, as you can steal that base, that was a very important uh, thing to do. Uh, sure. he used to, you know, he used to go ahead and run. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Hitting that ground ball was after the fact. Now Doug Bear comes out of the St. Louis bullpen as we go to the seventh inning. Jerry Royster to lead things off. 3-2 Atlanta. Lined in the left field for a base hit. Smith getting it back in. So Doug Bear, Number 17, whose wife Connie baseman. gave birth yesterday. He's going to have to hold, he's going to have to hold uh, Royster very, very close here. He's liable to steal on him. He's one of the guys that can steal for that Atlanta ball club. And here's a guy that he likes to hit and run with. Makes good contact, hits the ball all fields. He's going to bunt him along. Bear makes the play over to first base. Hernandez for the put out. And Royster goes down to second. One away in the seventh inning. And it brings up Bruce Benedict. 0 oh, 2 pitch. A missed sign there. And it's 1 and 2. Ozzie Smith was in a second behind Royster and Bear came to the plate and let the whole left side of the infield open. Here's Pokorova. Satori's figuring. He's got six very good innings out of Negro. On two days rest after going four and a third. Why let him go any further? Why change it at this point when you've got a Garber and when you may have to bring Negro back from game five with everything on the table with two days rest? And Garber's been his bread and butter man all year, and he's the guy that uh, has had that outstanding year for the Braves with 30-some saves. 30, yep. Three and two to count. And he loses Benedict. So runners at first and second. One out. And Biff Pokoroba. Catcher by trade. Negro, number four, Fifth Pokoroba. Pinch hitting. Pokoroba. 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 Seasonal Pokoroba. figures Pokoroba. right there. As a pinch hitter this season, Pokoroba was four for 17, but he made the hits pay off. He had nine runs batted in. He's a tough hitter. He makes contact, and uh, he hits the ball all over. You know, uh, Biff was a switch hitter. This year, uh, he's concentrated on strictly uh, batting from the left side. He's given up hitting from the right side. Chopper to the right side. Her has 
one play. That's first base to the out, and the runners advance to second and third. So Royster moves up 90 feet, as does Benedict. You might see an intentional walk right here. It's a resourceful team. You've got to give the Braves enormous credit for those of you who don't follow baseball very closely during the season and get interested in postseason play. It's just a remarkable story in itself. The team wins 13 straight to begin the year, build up a huge lead, blow it all, look like they fall out of the race, get back on top, start to fade again, 10 back, or 10 games to go, they're three games back, go on the road for their last seven, win five of those seven, and come up a winner. They're to be commended. They never gave up. They kept battling, and uh, that's, uh, that's why they're here today. Ramirez at the plate. A strike. Oh, and one. Even in Atlanta, they were writing when the Braves fell out of it initially. They said the trip to Fantasy Island is over. And another thing, they're in the playoffs without a left-handed pitcher, a starting pitcher, or a left-handed relief pitcher. Here's the one-two delivery. Hit in the air to left center field. Willie McGee is racing back in his room and is there and makes the catch. And the Cardinals are very much still in it. And they hit that ball a long way. No runs, a hit, lead three, middle of the seventh, three, two, Atlanta. Message was furnished by Major League Baseball. Going to the bottom of the seventh inning, Team Garbert comes in to pitch for the Atlanta Braves. Garbert, despite a losing record, eight and ten. The key uh, figure right there is the second one. Saves. Also, the ERA obviously outstanding at 2.34. So, Garber, again, coming in a little bit earlier than he normally would, but he's well-rested. And again, let's now set it for you tomorrow. The American League Championship will be decided. One game for the title. 4 o'clock Eastern time. Probables there. Keeson for California. Vukovic for Milwaukee. And then we'll go to Atlanta. Game three coming up tomorrow night there. 8 o'clock Eastern Time. It's going to be some game in Milwaukee. Oh, oh boy. Game 5, the big one. All the marbles riding. The winner goes to the Fall Classic. I imagine the, most of the Angels and the Brewers are probably looking on tonight, trying to get some sleep tonight. <laughs> trying to go to bed early. Well, it's going to be very interesting. Tough to sleep well, I would think, on a night like tonight. I'd imagine we'll so. the line tomorrow. Tommy Hur is the batter as we go to the bottom of the seventh inning. Gene Garber starts him with a strike. 0 oh 1. Very big play in this game right now. You go back to the bottom of the sixth inning. Darrell Porter that doubled to drive in Hernandez with the relay from Washington to Ramirez, the shortstop, and then the throw into Horner to get Porter at third. Saved off any further damage. 3-2, Atlanta. Because Henrik's got an infield hit at the next hitter, right. which would have resulted in the tie-in run scoring. Right. Later in the inning, Ozzie Smith had a base hit. Down the way. And they'd have still had another out. And down he goes. Tommy Hur can't believe the call. By Bob Engel. All right, you check it out. Looked like it painted that mm. inside corner. Chambliss scoops it up. Three unassisted. Two down and Lonnie Smith is the batter. This telecast presented by authority of Major League Baseball may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Here he is, the spinning top on the mound, Tommy. Style of Garber. He turns, his, he turns his back to the hitter. He's, he becomes very deceptive. He hides the ball very, very well. And um, that's what makes him tough to hit. It's very difficult for the batter to pick up the ball. Here he hides it right there. Outside Lonnie Smith. One and oh. You don't see his hand in the baseball for a, until the last moment. Corner. Corner's guarding. 
he's guarding, he's guarding the line. He does not. He doesn't want the ball to be hit between him and the bag for an extra base hit. Down in his direction. One and one. I've seen guys hug lines before. That's about as close as you're going to play. That's what you have to do in this situation. You must guard the line and not give the batter the double. He'll hit a ball. They'll, they'll give him the base hit between third and short, but not the ball down the line. so much he lost his bat and the count is one and two. And Lonnie Smith goes down swinging. Nothing doing for the cards through seven. Three two Atlanta back in St. Louis after this word from our local stations. Some final scores for you. West Virginia over Boston College by seven. Alabama beating Penn State by three touchdowns. Virginia Tech eking one out over Duke. Georgia rolling. North Carolina likewise. Illinois in a wild one. Four-point win. Look out deep. Iowa over Indiana by four. Missouri-Kansas State a 7-7 tie. Here's Dale Murphy as we go to the eighth inning, fouling one away, and the count is 0-1. Look how deep Ozzy Smith is playing, Murphy. Smith, that shortstop, as you can see behind the white line, I'm moving in a step or so. Fast surface here. One and one again, we'll point out what we did the other night as you look at some other final scores. Michigan winning by 14, Northwestern. What a year, two wins. Notre Dame by two. Wisconsin beating the Buckeyes. Nebraska, seventh ranked. Arkansas, ninth ranked. Winning today. 1 1 pitch is hit into left field for a base hit. Point wanted to make on Murphy again. Those of you who don't Number follow it day by day. Big man, power hitter. Think about those fellas as big lumbering guys with no speed. That's not the case. Murphy with very good speed a threat to steal. He'll steal that base on you. He's very quick. Base hit here. That's his first hit in the championship series. He was 0 for 4 Thursday night. And now 1 for 4 tonight. And Chris Chambliss, the batter. Chambliss 0 for 3 tonight. And 0 for 6 in the two games. There he goes. There he goes. The pitch is outside. Porter's throw scooped out by Smith. Murphy probably would have beaten it anyway had he come up with it cleanly. So Murphy with a stolen base here in the eighth inning. Another look. Porter threw a man out the other night with a terrible throw. This one is a better throw but doesn't get the job done as Ozzie can't scoop it out of the dirt. Murphy going in with that left arm to the outside. Now with the count... Oh, boy. For ball four, that was pretty close. Pete Rose swings at that pitch. <laughs> if they try to walk him intentionally. So Chambliss goes to first. Runners at first and second with nobody out. Now, Whitey Herzog. He's telling the umpire that if he takes him out, he's going to make a double switch because he wants to keep Suter from coming to bat the next inning. What he's doing, he's going to take Lonnie Smith out. And Smith made the last out. There he is. He made the last out. And they'll put Suter in his spot. Bring in David Green to play left. And when we come back in the eighth inning with nobody out, Atlanta runners at first and second. They lead 3 2. Bruce Suter ready to work in the eighth inning. Now runners at first and second. Bob Horner 0 for 3 tonight. Takes outside. Ball one. That double switch. David Green goes in to play left field. Green hits ninth. And then Suter bats in Lonnie Smith's spot, number three, since Smith made the last out in the preceding inning. As you notice, Whitey went to the plate umpire. And the reason why he did that, he has to notify the umpire before he walks out to the mound that he will make the double switch. If he walks to the mound and then takes the pitcher out and then tries to take the left fielder out, he can't do it. I saw poor Charlie Fox make that move when he was managing the Giants one night in Pittsburgh. Team in the throws of a losing streak. Tried to make the switch, but didn't tell him it was simultaneous. Had two guys in, both in the wrong spot in the order. Two and one account. Two and two. Bruce Suter, premier relief 
pitcher in the National League over the past four seasons. He's led the National League in saves. 36 this season and 37 back in 79 with Chicago. And he gets home. He's tough. I've seen this guy so many times do the job. He's very tough. And you know, because he throws a split finger fastball, which reacts almost like a knuckleball. He developed the pitch under the tutelage of pitching coach Fred Martin when he was with the Cubs. And had he not come up with that pitch, he was just doing a so-so job. And then when he did develop it, and he's the only one that can do it, he became one of the premier pitchers in baseball. Royce heard the plate. They're running from second. The throw down to Oberg fell, and they nail Murphy. So Dale Murphy figuring he could steal third. Chambliss remained at first with a double steal either not on or somebody missed the sign. And Murphy is gone. Oh. Pretty close play there. The tag made on one knee and the other foot in there. Second out of the inning. And 0-1 the count on Royster. 0-2. Here it is again. Overfell. Loving it. The throw is right there. Right foot gets to the bag. Tag is made on the left knee. He, oh, he's there. Yes, he is. He was in there. Dutch Renner, with that benefit of a replay, of course, the third base. On a bang-bang play. No ball, two strikes to count. and Bruce gets this crowd fired up as he gets out of the jam in the eighth inning. Bruce, Bruce, Bruce goes to stand at the end of seven and a half at Bush Stadium. Atlanta three and St. Louis two. Keith Hernandez will lead things off for the Cardinals as we go to the bottom of the eighth inning. He'll be followed by Darrell Porter and George Hendrick. Atlanta leading three to two. Cardinals leading in the series one game to nothing. Very exciting game, Al. And you know, when I mentioned about uh, Suter throwing a split finger fastball and it reacts like a knuckleball or a forkball, it's a little bit different. The split finger fastball is thrown with the fingers slightly spread apart, whereas the forkball, you open your fingers as far as they can go, and then you stick the ball in it. And that's the difference between a forkball and a split-fingered fastball. A lot of fellas have tried to come up with this pitch, but unable to do so. Dale Murphy has moved to left field, and Brett Butler, you saw him, he comes in defensively now in center field as Royster comes out. Scoring summary now, Cardinals getting a run in the first on a wild pitch. In the third inning, Benedict the walk, and then the key play, Ramirez, a single, McGee overran it, three base error, two to one. Number one, Jerry Fifth inning, Atlanta made it 3-1, Necro driving and Hubbard with a sacrifice fly. Sixth Royce inning, Jerry Hernandez with a base hit, and Porter with a double to drive in a run, and then he was thrown out at third. Royster stays in the game. Royster comes in from left field to play third. The man who goes out of the game is Porter. And Joe. there's Jerry now, and you can put Butler in Horner's spot, number five. Joe has tightened up his defense. Butler is in center field. He can really go get the ball. Forster, uh, Royster is an outstanding third baseman. Keith Hernandez rounds it down to Hubbard, picks it up off his hip, and throws him out. Tough play for Glenn. Ball picking up speed on the turf. And here's a play featuring Darrell Porter, the next batter, sixth inning. Now watch here, he drives in a run with a double. Hernandez comes in to score while this takes place. But now Washington throwing to Ramirez, the shortstop, who was the cutoff man, and down the third to Porter to get Porter going in. He would have scored on the base hit by Hendrick next, and had he done that, we would have been tied right now. So a very big play at the moment throw from Washington to Ramirez into Horner as Porter looks at a strike in the count of 0-1. 1-1 now to count. In this situation, Al Porter's capable of hitting the ball out of the ballpark, and what Barber is 
trying to do is keeping the ball away from where it can't hit it out of the park. Darrell hit 12 this season. He was second on the club. And the count is two balls and one strike. Coming down. Look 
look at that pitch. McGee goes after a pitch well out of the strike zone. Stops it over Garber's head. Ramirez is playing halfway. Comes in. He's thinking about a double play because he makes the tag there, but he has no chance because McGee is so swift. He's down at first base. So we're tied 3-3. McGee to run to get the opportunity right here. Now he's going to have to hold him very, very close with Ozzie Smith hitting. Barber will throw over there a few times. Barber will keep throwing over there. And the best thing you can do when you have a guy that can run or likes to steal is try to hold the ball as long as you can will get him off the balls of his feet and eventually get back on his heels because he can't stay up there too long. as possible. There he goes, and it's grounded foul outside first. So they send him 0-2 and bring him back now. When you can get back to, to the base very easy, that means you're not taking enough lead. 1-2 pitch, foul away. The chances are with Garber, you're not going to be fooled with Gene the way he delivers. He's not going to get you leaning the other way, really some other pitchers would. Well, Willie McGee is, uh, you know, he's a rookie. Uh, he's just starting out in the big leagues and uh, he's just not able to pick up any keys on the pitcher as well as the more experienced uh, base stealer will. But eventually he will he will pick up those different uh, keys and uh, be able to steal a lot more bases. juncture of the game. Playoffs. You're the time for go-ahead run. Grounded down to the right side. Covered up with it. And he throws Smith out. So it takes a while. But Garber works out of the eighth after the Cardinals get a run to tie it. We're tied 3-3 back after this from our local station. We go to the ninth inning in St. Louis. Al Michaels with Tom Lasorda. A 3-3 tie in game two. Glenn Hubbard to lead off. Benedict to follow and Garber's spot. Suter not having success at all this year against the Braves during the regular season. Hubbard takes a strike. Suter, as he's prone to do, more comfortable out of the stretch with nobody on base. Fouling it away. It's something more and more pitchers seem to be going to. Al Holland of the Giants is another one who does it all right, the time. Right, left-hander. Seven hits, one error for the Cardinals. Bruce Suter pitched well with the Cubs, but like Bruce pointed out just recently, 37 saves over there wasn't doing any good. One two pitch is outside, two and two of the count. So Whitey Herzog got him. Remember he, he picked up Raleigh Fingers from San Diego, then got Suter, then sent Fingers up to Milwaukee. bat in the bottom of the inning. They'll have David Green leading off. He came into the game in the seventh inning in the number nine spot. Then you go to the top of the order, Her and Oberk fell. Followed by the pitcher spot. A strike. That's right, because Suter's hitting in the number three spot with Lonnie Smith out of the game. Great start 
this season. He went into a swale period, though, in May and June. Then he rebounded from that, and he was unconscious the last three months. Untouchable. Down to Smith. Two guys. The vacuum. So two away. And Gene Garber batting for himself. Suter down off the mound, fielding up along the line, and he does the job in the top of the ninth. To the Cardinals coming up in the bottom of the ninth inning, the score tied 3-3. Three, three. National League Series, of course, is two days behind because of the two rainouts. Cardinals in Atlanta. We'll be with you from Atlanta Fulton County Stadium tomorrow at 8 o'clock Eastern Time. So the American League will be over tomorrow, and we could be going until Tuesday. Cardinals have other ideas, however. They're looking for a sweep. They lead one game to nothing. We're tied here in game two, 3-3, three, three, bottom of the ninth inning. Gene Garber will go to work on David Green, Tommy Herr, and Ken Oberkfeld. Is hitting fourth this inning, and if he gets in a hitting situation, he may have to go to the pitch shutter. There's Cott. Green was part of that blockbuster trade with Milwaukee in the winter of 1980, and one of the key men in the deal. Right along with pitcher Dave LaPointe, also Larry Sorensen, and Cicero Liscano came in that deal. Ted Simmons. Fingers and Pete Bukovic went to the Brewers. So they gave up a lot. And they got in green anyway. A fellow they think will be in their starting outfield for years to come, but right now he's having a good time breaking into the starting outfield. Well, the reports that Whitey had on Green's minor league career were outstanding, and that's why he insisted on Green in the trade. Takes outside for ball one. Outstanding player in the major leagues. He was playing regularly earlier this season when he got hurt. That's when they brought McGee up and they couldn't get Willie out of the lineup. Foul away. One ball and one strike to count on Green. Green. Born in Nicaragua. playing close to the line of third. Green able to find the hole, get it through, and there's the winning run. And there's a man whose team is trying to avoid going down 0-2. Again, you got to look for Dane Ork to come out in a situation to pinch hit for Suter. Tommy Herr coming up. Probably to bunt. You would normally do in this situation with a winning run at first base. How about green speed, Tommy? Outstanding. Tremendous speed. Put him in the clash with McGee. Yes, you put him in that clash, yes. And here, you know, it was a tremendous double switch by Whitey Herzog, and that's why Green was hitting in that situation in the pitcher spot. Go to first base. Green in only 76 games this season and off times as a pinch hitter or defensive replacement still had 11 steals Royster well in at third waiting for the butt her squares lays it down good butt does the job super butt he dead that ball very good whereas he didn't butt the ball too hard back to the pitcher and that's the secret of butting is deadening the ball coming off the bat 
If the hitter goes out with the bat, then the ball will come off a lot harder. He takes the ball, hit the bat, and then a slight give with the hands, allowing the ball to come off very slowly. And that's what you have to do here when everybody in the ballpark knows you're going to lay one down. So driver right. over to Hubbard covering. And the winning run is at second. Now Torrey goes to the mound. Olbert fell is the batter. You've got first base open. Now you've got the number three spot occupied by Suter. Up next, Whitey Herzog's not going to tip his hand for the moment. He sent Suter out into the on-deck circle as they discuss strategy. Well, well, he's asking him who he would rather pitch against, Oberfeld or Hernandez or the, or the pinch hitter. And uh, Garber's going to Garber's going to tell him whether he's going to walk him intentionally or not. Well, let's see what Garber told him, and Torrey's got to know it too because Overfell is six for ten lifetime against Garber. And Garber may uh, may not put, even put him on intentionally. If he doesn't, he's not going to give him anything good to hit. So Overfell six for ten. Not only that, but a home run for a man who hits very few. In fact, he has only eight in his career. And he could set up the double play also. So Garber's been no mystery to him, and yet he's going to pitch to him. Pitch to him. Hmm. Okay. Rest is sure he won't give him anything good to hit. It could be an unintentional, intentional walk, but he does give him something, and he rips it foul. Hmm. Oh, and one. No balls, one strike to count. Corey is aware of that particular figure. Joe is in his first year with Atlanta, and those stats with Garber go back a little ways. Dean's got to know it. Maybe not the exact figure, but he knows over at Phil Hitson. Tough situation right here. The right center field. Butler on the run. Reaches up here. Makes the catch. Green around third. Comes in to score. And the Cardinals lead two games to nothing. Georgia tonight for the St. Louis Cardinals who beat the Braves 4-3. to three. 